And we're back. You're listening to the Talking Box on Billy C Show right here on ESPN New Hampshire. Glad you guys could join us. Don't forget about our website, www.billycboxing.com. We post uh, all the news that's fit to print, not only on the front page, but you got to bang around. There's a section. It's called Latest Boxing News. Imagine that. You know, we try to... We try to fool you. So we put all the latest boxing news under a section called the latest boxing news. Imagine that. And uh, you can also get my book under the book club section. Check it out, man. www.billycboxing.com. While you're at it, follow us on Twitter. It's at Talkin Boxing. T-A-L-K-I-N-B-O-X-I-N-G. And uh, joining us right now, uh, for the first time in over a year, well, I guess a calendar year. I don't know how you call it, but uh, Boxing Hall of Fame of my man. Larry has it. What's up, brother? Hey, Billy. Happy New Year, buddy. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Happy New Year to you. It's been a year since we talked. But I'll tell you, like I was uh, chatting with you in the email earlier. It's like, we miss you, man. We miss you. You know, it seems seems like you haven't been on the show forever, doesn't it? It, it certainly does, and I miss being on the show. So it's great to be back. And, um, hey, man, another year, 2016. So let's just hope that 16 was halfway. I, I'm, I'm hoping that 16 could be halfway as good as 15, and I'll be satisfied. I just can't believe it's 2016. I mean, I mean, you know, I remember. It sounds in, like I, a space movie, doesn't I, it? It does. It's uh, it, you know, I, I remember. I remember in the 80s talking about the year 2000. I, I swear, I thought we were right, going to be like the right. Jetsons. Remember the Jetsons? I mean, that was you know, that's oh, what I figured. You know, like uh, oh yeah, you know, 2000. Oh geez, you know, now it's like 2015. Wow, yeah. You know, wow. it's <laughs> it's nothing yeah. but. Hey, you know that that's a great segue uh, about uh, what you just said uh, because I wanted to get your thoughts. Uh, you know, in a nutshell, have you given any thoughts of what you you know think of how 2015 was for the sport of boxing? Is there anything specific you know uh, that you could uh, you know just say that you know you, you knew took place and you saw and you were you were glad it took place, or even maybe on the other side, maybe maybe something that took place in 2015 that you you didn't like? What 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 will you remember about well, boxing? Well, well, what I remember, you know, now that you just you you know, mention it. 2015, to me, kind of represents the, um, you know, I think boxing kind of turned the corner uh, in a positive way. I think the PVC, of course, you know, I've been a big, big advocate of that because of what it's, what I think it has done for the sport. And um, I also think that, you know, 2015 was sort of like the age of enlightening, enlightenment for us in terms of um, the fights that the fans wanted to see. I think that I think that there's been uh, a, a new awakening on the part of a lot of the major promoters as it as it pertains to making the uh, fights that the fans really want to see. So I think that there's a new attitude going forward. At least I hope so. In, in 2016, and I think that you know the sport kind of really turned the corner. Especially, you know, toward the middle of the year, going toward the end of the year, I think that things really start to look up, started to look up for our sport, and I hope that it carries over to this year. I'm really hoping, you know, I'm really uh, looking forward to it. You know, that, that's interesting because one of the notes I had here I wanted to ask you about was, you know, it seems, and I agree with you about the PBC. I, I was talking about that the other day, and. I'm really curious to see how it unfolds because I, I still stick to my predictions that, you know, it's it, it's got to come into focus, good or bad, you know, by May of, of this year. And so we're going to we're going to see if it's going to keep going the way it is or not, because uh, obviously even even Al Heyman's uh, war chest full of cash is going to come to an end at some point. But with that yes. said, with that said, you know, I, I kind of saw and one thing that. You know, we've talked about a lot, and and something I feel strongly about is that I believe that boxing needs unity. You know, we do need to see promoter A fighting, uh, uh, you know, uh, promoter A's fighter fighting promoter B's fighter. You know, because that's the fight to make. But I, I kind of, you know, especially as the year wound down, twenty fifteen, I kind of thought that there was more division. You know, we're seeing 
like little mini leagues popping up, you know, uh, UFC wannabes. You know, you got the PBC, which is doing well. Then you have HBO and you have the Showtime stuff. And uh, now you sprinkle in some of these other cards that are that are coming around. And, you know, it just seems like a, a lot of these fighters are, are not fighting the fights. You know, you're, you're talking about uh, sanctioning bodies and relationships with specific promoters. And it, it almost seems like the division is, is more. What do, you, what do you think on that? Well, I, I don't. I don't necessarily think that there's a greater uh, division. I just think that it's there's people trying to um, find a place in the sport because of what's going on. I think that they see the, what's unfolding, and everybody wants to be a part. But I don't. I don't really think that there's a, uh, a greater level of division. I. I didn't see it that way. Although I do agree with you uh, on the other thing that you said about the PVC, um, you know, this has got to be the payoff year. And I think, like you always said, around May, certainly sooner or later we have to begin to see, you know, if it's, if it's really going to, uh, going to pay off for Al, you know, and um, hopefully it will, and hopefully it will for, for boxing overall. But I, I, I you know, these little, the little players, the little players want to be a part also because I think they have a or they have a feeling of excitement about what's unfolding also. And you're going to always have, I think now, in, in the age of boxing, you're going to always have these little fringe players and uh, these little fringe groups popping up. But it's still bringing more to the table. You know, you never know, you know, what's going to come out of there. But everybody wants in, Al, um, Billy. Everybody wants in, and I think that's that's what you're seeing. I think that's more a reflection of that. Everybody wants a piece. Well, and, you, know, uh, you know, let's see what happens. You know, I, I tell you, I, I didn't mean it to sound like, uh, negative towards so, like some of these small, uh, smaller promoters or even the small shows because I've always said, as a matter of fact, I, I wrote an article about it some years ago that club shows are really the backbone of the sport of boxing. I mean, because Absolutely. you know, without these club shows of fighters that you never heard of and maybe fighters you'll never see again, there wouldn't be the big pay per views and everything else. So I, I, I think that we, and, and that's what scares me about some of the direction that it seems to be going the sport because. Because, you know, if these little guys, if the little shows can't afford to happen, you know, what's the long-term ramifications for the sport? You know, that's what scares me. And, you know, and you know you're, very, you're very correct in that. And I'll give you a perfect example. You know, in some of, even right here in New Jersey, you know, you've got the major promoters who have done well in the sport. I think that they have to now redirect some of their efforts toward those smaller promoters or toward some of these smaller events. Even the big promoters don't always have to go to the big venue. The big promoters could also um, uh, do, do some of the smaller, you know, get go back and get some of the B-League guys and develop them in a smaller venue and keep the smaller venues going. That's the farm team of boxing. And without the farm team, you know, you, you won't have the uh, big league. So I agree. I agree with you 100% there that sometimes it's a little frightening when I see some of the major promoters sort of just, you know, don't have any any interest whatsoever in the small. If the casinos are not interested, they're not interested. And that's no good. That's not That's not a good thing. You know, I think that the small arenas, the club, what we call the club arenas, the club fights, that's the backbone of boxing. And I think that the big promoters, once they get big, you know, it wouldn't hurt every now and then if they would do a, you know, just a mid-range event, a small event, a local event, just to keep everybody active and keep everything moving. So that's, that's the backbone of boxing, and I think that's what's going to move the sport forward in the future. Well, you know, it, it's interesting point, and and obviously we got the the perfect guy to to add answer my next question. Um, you know, if you take that same 
uh, thought that we're, we're talking about with like small promoters, club shows, and stuff like that. And now you, you, you incorporate the commission that's uh, the governing commission of wherever this show is going to be. You know, if commissions aren't willing, and, and I know it's a tough subject, Larry, because you can't make, you know, special uh, deals with one promoter and not the other. I mean, it's just you just can't do it. You have rules and, and rules are rules, you know. But, but, I mean, it's almost like that's kind of what's happening. You know, without television or without another um, source of revenue, some of these small shows that the promoters can't even afford to do anymore. I mean, should commissions look differently on small shows? Should they look at, should they look at the amount of seats that can be sold? I mean, should there be a change there? Well, it's certainly a, a, a proactive way of looking at it. it. It certainly is something that is worthy of, of discussion. I mean, it's another it's another uh, element of the sport, um, another issue that needs to be addressed to help the growth of the sport. And uh, these are the type of ideas that need to be put on the table. So I say yes. Maybe commissions should begin to um, look at the small promoter and have a different, not a different set of rules, but maybe, you know, there's some type, uh, some type of leniency that could be geared towards the smaller guys until they become big guys. You know what I mean? Well, so, yeah, I, like I don't think that's such a bad idea. No, I think that's a creative way of of helping the growth of the sport. I'm, without, I'm, I'm, I'm without looking. making major compensations, you know, in rules and regulations, they remain the same. Exactly. What I'm, what, what maybe something as simple as, you know, if there's no television revenue and all the promoter is relying on is, is, uh, you know, ticket sales and the venue can hold 200 people, then maybe the cost of doing that show should be cheaper than the cost of doing a show in Madison Square Garden. I mean, because the way it's set now, you know, a, a promoter. Uh, you know, at least, uh, you know, in the states that I promoted, you know, you, you, there's X amount of money you're putting up front and, and uh, you know, the size of the venue never is brought in. You know, TV revenue is never mentioned. You know, it's just, you know, hey, this is what it costs. You know, uh, you, this is what you got to do. And, you know, when you crunch your numbers and, and you know, you're selling $25 tickets and, uh, you know, you, you got 400 seats, uh, you don't really need a calculator to figure out what your budget is, you know. And a lot of these guys right, are, right, be, they become, right. they become one and done. And one one and done promoters are the worst thing for all of us. It's worse. It's a bad thing for the uh, commissions. It's bad for the venues. It's bad for the fighters. It's it's bad for everybody involved in in boxing. You need guys that are going to be around for a while. Yeah, and I and I think that what you're saying is right. I agree with that 100. percent You know, we have to constantly uh, be looking for um, newer and better ways to uh, you know help the growth. And development of the sport because you know boxing and combative sports they're forever developing there's a constant evolution things change conditions change issues change and from a regulatory standpoint we have to also be willing to make adjustments to uh to help the sport so i agree with that 100 percent no that's that's a proactive um to me that's a very proactive way of trying to uh, help the sport develop and even get bigger, I agree with that. Yeah, you, you know, you you have to uh, you have to you know do something to keep it going. But hey, what's your thoughts? Let me jump back into some things that are going on in the sport. Um, uh, for sure, like like Canelo, you know, he won the uh, uh, world middleweight title uh, from uh, from Miguel Cotto. And, you know, now he, they're talking about defenses and everything else, but he's adamant about not fighting over 155 pounds, which technically is uh, the middle. It is a middleweight. But what's your thoughts on, on you know, him forcing other middleweights to only fight at 155? And, and more than that, the, the, the sanctioning body, in this case the WBC, not really saying much on that. Uh, you know, how do you feel about that? Well, you know, you know I'm old school. And I'm proud to be old school because it was old school that made boxing the great sport that it is. And with that being said, as much as I like Canelo, I think he's one of the stars of the future. I think they got a lot of nerve 
with some of this catch. What you're talking about is this catch weight crap that goes on. Okay, I'm not such a great advocate of catch weight, although if you got the right fighters who have agreed to fight at a certain weight, okay, and these are the the fights that the fans want to see, no problem. But when it comes to weight classes, if you are a middleweight and you are the middleweight champion, middleweight is 160 pounds, okay? Now, if you choose to fight at 155, 156, 157, that's fine. But I don't think that a fighter, regardless of who he is, should have enough power or enough gall to be able to dictate to another fighter that he has to, if he's a middleweight, that but but you you can't weigh 160. You got to weigh 154 or 155. To me, that's ridiculous. If you want to weigh less than 160 pounds, that's fine. But as long as I don't weigh more than 160, then I'm within my weight class. And I think that's the way it should be. See, and I think that when the sanctioning organizations back this stuff up, before you know it, there won't be, well, what's the sense in having weight classes, period? That's well, my feeling on that. Well, I, I, to, to, I agree with you 100%, but, you know, the sanctioning bodies, I, I think, is most of the problem because, you know, these are the same guys, number one, they approve it. Number two, they juggle their titles around just so that they can collect a sanctioning fee. I mean, I, you know, I just read the other day, uh, so-and-so was elevated to, to super champion, so now the other fight that's taking place in a week can be for our other title, you know, and it's like, come on, man. I mean, it, it's not like they're... They're earning it, you know. They're moving it around for their for their own, you know, financial gain. And 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 which brings me to the next uh, point, you know, every sanctioning body, at least the top four, have their own um, contenders. You know, they have their own ranking system. And you know what's happening today is I believe that those sanctioning bodies are actually allowing you know promoters and managers and and fighters uh, to a degree. Although I blame most of. Uh, you know, cupcake feedings uh, on the promoter and manager, not the fighter. But, you know, what, what's happening is these guys are, are building up their records and, and then all of a sudden they're, they're in a major fight against a real fighter and they get blown out. Then what's the thing everybody says? Oh, he was exposed. Oh, this guy was exposed. They're, they're not climbing the ladder the way they used to be, Larry. And, and I think that the fighters aren't being given an opportunity to get better. You know, is there anything that you can think of that we could do as a some kind of a and I know it's hard because the, the sanctioning bodies won't want to do it. But is there should there be some type of a unified um, uh, contender? You know, like a, a, a top contender, unified, sort of like the computer rankings. Well, I don't, I don't know, Billy. I, I, I me personally, I think that that's that's something that the sanctioning organizations should really rethink. Because that's that's really where they they're not doing a good good thing for the sport. I, I I actually feel that weight classes should be weight classes, okay, the way that they are, okay. And if a fighter wins a title, if he fight if he's going to fight in a specific weight class, then he can fight anywhere in that class. I mean, you can't these catch weights are the thing that's ruining the sport, okay. I'm not in favor of these catch weights. And what happens here is I think because of the uh, financial incentive that the sanctioning organizations are looking to gain is why all of this is happening. And I don't think it's a good thing for the sport. Well, it, couldn't it even be looked upon as a safety issue, Larry? I mean, if you got a guy that... That let's say, I mean, you know, for example, it's probably not a good one, but let since we're talking about Canelo, let's say, you know, he uh, limits a fighter to 155, you know, he's able to make the weight, then he uh, hydrates up to, to 170 fight night, but, uh, you know, they forget to tell you that they actually brought in a welterweight who had a gain weight to make 155, so now, fight night, it could be a 20-pound difference or more between the two fighters. I mean, can it be used as a safety issue, especially with the smaller guys. Well, yeah. Well, what you're saying is absolutely correct. And that's what's happening all the time. 
know, when these guys go in there, they're not they're not fighting in weight class when they go in the fights anyhow. And this is what's happening. So it is. It's, it is a safety issue, and it should be addressed. But, I mean, you know, here we go again. The status quo always, you know, sells out. But that's what we have. What's, let me ask you this, Larry. What's the what's the swing in 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 your state, in Jersey? What what won't you allow? You know, if 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 I bring a fighter and it's a welterweight fight, and and you got one guy uh, uh, weighing one forty seven, and his opponent is is one forty one, it's a six pound swing. Uh, d- does New Jersey allow no, that? No, 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 no. Six pounds is too much. Too much. Okay. Okay. So Absolutely. so, so Absolutely. what? We so, go one or two. We usually go one pound. Actually. So so one pound. Oh, so so in other words, if you're fighting in a welterweight fight, and uh, the you know the red corner weighs in at one forty seven, and the blue corner steps on the scale at one forty one, a six pound swing, you won't allow the fight. Oh no, that fight don't go, man. Oh no, oh no. Hmm. See, and that's what I'm saying. You can't just come in and you know if these and, and see and, and 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 what's happening is is that you actually. It's actually getting to a point where they're just matching weights, okay? They'll have, okay, this is a well away bout, okay, but but fighter comes in at, or, or they've agreed to fight at 144 pounds or 145 pounds. Okay, so if one guy comes in at 145, okay, and another guy comes in at 140. 49, okay, then that fight ain't going. Well, or if one comes in. You, you understand? You yeah, follow what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah but, but, but I mean, in, in a case where you, normally the, the contract would read. Uh, in, at a weight, you know, fighter A agrees to fight fighter B at a weight not to exceed X, you know, uh, not to exceed 148. Sometimes you'll see uh, 148 plus one, 148 plus two, you know, that where okay. you have, you know, but but not to exceed. So then there's uh, uh, most commissions have that other that other rule where they say, well, you know, the guy didn't exceed 148, but. He only weighs 141. You know, it's a seven-pound swing. We're not going to let the fight happen. It's too much of a difference. And some states are different. Six pounds is some. Some are seven. You know, I was just curious to know what Jer- New Jersey was. No, 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 no. We we six pounds will not go. Okay? See, because that's a t- that's a that's a tough that's a tough thing because in the in the example we just said. 147, a welterweight fight, weight limit on a contract, 147. One guy weighs 147 on the nose at the weigh-in. The other guy weighs 141. He's a welterweight. That's right. You know, that's so, not going to happen. Yeah, no, no. 141, 141, he's really not even a welterweight. No, I know, but technically he is because 140 is the limit for junior. You know, so so you open up a whole other can of worms. Like, I, was, I witnessed a fight one time, a heavyweight fight. And you know the rule, anybody over 200 pounds. Well, one guy weighed 200 and, and, and like 202 pounds, and I, I swear to God, the, uh, the guy must have had rolls yeah. of quarters in his shoes or something. And then his opponent was like 260, and the commission wouldn't yeah. let it happen. And the argument was, yeah. well, it's a heavyweight fight, Any, anything over 200. So it's, it's kind of a gray area, isn't it? It is, it is a gray area. And at, and, and at one point, I was trying to advocate a super heavyweight division. While I was working for the IBF, you know what I mean? Because for that very reason, right there with a heavyweight. Because how could it be unsafe on one hand and not un- unsafe on the other hand? You know, because they're heavyweights. Why? Why? Because they're heavyweights. Because they just weight, you know, whatever. And you can't. And it's not that way in the other weight division. It's yeah. still a weight advantage. You know, and 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 you know, it, we we did those uh, at some point along the timeline because we thought it was safe. Because if you go back in, in the day, you know, you had guys uh, that were middleweights moving up to fight heavyweights just to, you know, I mean, Stanley Ketchell against Jack Johnson. I mean, there was there was there was a thirty pound swing in that fight, you know. So uh, yeah, well, they let you know they did it, and and in some fights, I guess there were some successes, but. I don't think that it's a safe thing to do. No. Then why do you have weight class? 
No, I, why it, do you have weight class? No, I, I know, and then it goes right back to what we were saying. And how can a middleweight say that the fight can only be one fifty-five? You know, what I mean, right. it's so it's right. such a gray area. Hey, Larry, before we let you go, one quick question: What, if any, is the most important fight you think we need to see here in 2016 is there any fight in your mind that you're saying to yourself man this fight has to happen yeah yeah i think we have to see um uh, triple g i think we have to see triple g and maybe canelo or triple g and and um andre ward yeah, no, I I agree, and uh, I lied. I got one more quick question for you. Manny Pacquiao announced that his uh, his so called last fight is against Timothy Tim Bradley. Bradley. Yeah, I, you know, I, personally, Larry, I love the fight, and I think it shows that he's trying to seek out a a, a good opponent for his last fight, win or lose. It, it's arguably a guy that uh, many people have in their pound for pound list, and Timothy Bradley. What's your quick thoughts on that fight? Well, I think that I think that Timothy Bradley. It'll be a difficult fight for Timothy Bradley, okay? But um, it'll be a difficult fight also, too, for Pacquiao. So if this is going to be his farewell, you know, I, I, I think that he, he he in his farewell, I think that um, it's a good fight for him to go out on. You know, I, I don't see anybody else, you know, around there that would, you know, that, that would come close to, you know, giving him, the type of competition that 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 we would feel is legitimate. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, uh, hey, listen. All, I don't have any problem with all, that. All, all, all that, you know, if Timothy Bradley starts running into trouble, all, all, all Teddy Atlas has to do is remind him what firemen do, and then that should get him over the hump, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're going to have to remind him a little bit more than that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Larry, man, great, great to have you back. We look forward to you next week, my man. Okay, I'm looking forward to it, Billy. Good All right, stay guys. warm, man. It's finally here this winter. Yeah, and Happy New Year to all our listeners. Sounds good, my man, and Happy New Year to you and your family, all right? Okay, brother. Take care. That's my man Larry Hazard, Boxing Hall of Famer and uh, the New Jersey Boxing Commissioner, giving his thoughts and uh, interesting stuff. Interesting stuff. And, you know, I, it's always good to get Larry's take on things because he's right there on the pulse of, uh, you know, how the sport is run, especially from a commission and uh, some of the things that he goes through on a daily basis uh, to make these fights happen. Hey, listen, I'm going to take a short break. When I come back, I got some more emails to read. I got the news on Deontay Wilder, some of his statements. Somebody's got to fill this guy in. Nobody's afraid of you, Deontay. Doug 